This is the Erica Diamond Podcast, getting you motivated and inspired by conversations with today's thought leaders and coolest people. Each episode, get up close and personal with compelling guests who share stories and tips that empower you to live your best life. Now, let's get off the fence. Here's your host, Erica Diamond. Welcome to the Erica Diamond Podcast, fourth episode. I'm so thrilled you're here. And I'm really excited to have Sabrina Cassis of Alice Cass Lingerie here with us. We are exploring today in every way, and I really can't wait for this episode. I wanted to have Sabrina on the show because we met recently as two Lululemon luminaries in our Montreal community. I got to know Sabrina when we sat together in one of the icebreaker exercises where we had to explore and go back to our youth. Well, I didn't think it was going to be so deep, so real, so quickly. We shared candidly in our little group, getting to know each other, and I said to Sabrina, it feels as though you've lived many lives. You have so much wisdom from your experiences. I would love to you to come share them on my new podcast. And thankfully, Sabrina said yes. Hey, Sabrina. Hey, Erica. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Um, Yeah, that was was a pretty incredible (laughs) experience, first way to meet someone. Um, Oh, boy. Do we get started? (laughs) Yeah, let's get started. So Sabrina said yes, and here we are. So who is Sabrina Cassis? Well, she is the founder and creative director of Alice Cass Lingerie, and it's a lingerie curator, content creator, and she is a self-love advocate. Sabrina is known for her distinct sense of style and keen eye for standout pieces, as well as her passionate, authentic, and thought-provoking articles and interviews that inspire and empower the modern, independent woman. So welcome to the show, Sabrina. Before we dive in, um, it was so great to connect with you. You know, often we work together and collaborate, but everyone's kind of so busy doing their own thing in their own community. And I really didn't know you other than I followed you on Instagram. So it was so great to connect. And I'm so glad Lululemon brought us together. Yeah, no, that, that's so true. Um, social media, I mean, the way that we perceive other people, it's just one facet of our personality, I think. Um, I try to be as authentic as I can on Instagram, but it's always funny when I meet people in person and they're like, oh, you're the underwear girl who's always talking in her underwear. Um, so yeah, no, it's a great opportunity to kind of get to know you as well and uh, connect with a bunch of other women that have, yeah, everyone has a story to tell. So it was really, really nice. Yeah, that's true. I think that that was kind of an Oprah thing. Everyone has a story. But <laughs> so, so let's start. Let's, let's dive right in. Take me back to the beginning. What was your childhood like? I know a little bit after sitting with you during our Lululemon program, but take our listeners through that journey of, of your childhood to, to kind of, you know, maybe some of the experiences you learned growing up, but take us back. Childhood is such a big topic. Um, I mean, I think I... I, I was very lucky in a lot of ways, um, but I mean, I grew up a, like a middle child, so I had amazing siblings. Um, I was always really, really close to them. Um, my parents were very busy, so they worked a lot. So I kind of um, grew up, like my mom was super, like a, a woman who had this vision of really uh, accomplishing a lot, and she came from a poor background, so she her goal was to like leave her small town, come to Montreal and and start a career for herself, start a family. So she kind of did all that. And my dad was, uh, he's Greek, born in Egypt. So he was an immigrant. He came here when he was really young. And so they just like built a life for themselves. But they're, you know, like that generation, I think are a little bit disconnected from uh, their spirituality or from, you know, really pursuing their own passion. So I feel like they were very stuck in this world of like getting things done. and my dad was also very controlling and very uh, overbearing. So there was this, I was very isolated in a sense and I hung out alone a lot and I was very, um, so it, so it had a huge impact on me. I feel like we talked about like really intense specific things in our, uh, in our, um, in our, in our luminaries session. But uh, overall, I was like a weird kid. Like I always felt very different and I always had anxiety even as a child and I always, uh, like second guessed myself. So I think that's something that stuck with me, um, not being able to trust myself, um, always feeling pressure to be perfect or, or getting, you know, my dad had this like, I guess like 
anger issues in a sense. He's very like passionate, you know, he's Greek, so it's very fiery. Um, so there, there was a lot of just not being able to trust myself. And that's something that really stuck with me and not, and, and he was also very adamant about certain things that I think it, it really marked me and my, and my journey into lingerie and female empowerment. He would have these very like strong opinions about things. And he put these ideas in my head about men, I guess, and about, you know, like one of the things you'd say is men only want one thing. So that was one of the, <laughs> the he, he sounds like an overprotective dad, yeah. right? Trying to raise some good girls yeah. to make good choices. But you know, when you're controlling and when you're trying to like sort of not give children the space to be themselves and express themselves, it, it, it sort of leads to the opposite. And then to maybe, uh, you know, a darker, <laughs> darker outlets for, for expression, you know? Um, so I, I really loved what you were sharing when we, when we were in the, the thing about parenting um, and how you, you embrace your kids and all sides of them. And even when they're throwing tantrums that you still love them through that. I think that's something that's quite new. I think back then it was, you know, there, there, there is that tough love, that very strict idea of parenting. So I think that was, my childhood I grew up in the city I was very like I went to uh I went to a a French school so I think that another big thing is is this middle child idea and being like an in-between and never fitting in anywhere really like I went to an English school my mother tongue is French but I speak better in English like I always felt like in between never enough something and always too much of something else. And I feel like that's like a duality of Montreal that's very represented in Montreal, the French, the English, like the extremes of summer and winter. Like it's so fraught with like duality. And I feel like that's something that I really, really identify with uh, in general is this idea of never being enough or being too much for whatever group I'm in. Amazing. So you grew up with, you know, a tough dad, a strict dad, I guess, of course, you know, trying to raise some good girls and, and from all feeling maybe alone or isolated, what did you learn from these experiences? So when we chatted, you know, looking back now, what do you think you learned from, from growing up this way? And, and what kind of a woman do you think that it made you growing up with someone? So for me, I didn't have strict parents. And yeah. I had the duality of a very astute businessman father and a very loving and nurturing mom. And I was, my wings were never clipped. Like my parents, I remember I, I brought home a 67 on my dad's like, that's amazing. I know how hard you work. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I didn't have the parents who were like, you got a 92, where's yeah. the other 8%. I had yeah. parents who really encouraged me to spread my wings. And I'm very grateful for that. And I, I really love and nurture my kids. And yes, we did chat about when they're having a tantrum, I don't send them to their room. I hug them and I say, what is, you know, what's bothering you? Tell me why you're behaving this way. Cause I feel that we need love and support sometimes when we act out. Yeah. So what did you learn from all these experiences and, and what have they taught you? Yeah, so I definitely did not have that. I was very, I had a lot of pressure to be perfect, I think. Like I, I was always really good at school. So I was kind of a nerd as well. Um, I was never really part of the cool kid. I was cool kids. I was just kind of doing my own thing always. I was really into books. I was really into, it's so funny that I'm in lingerie now. <laughs> because it's like if people knew me, if you knew me back then, like I was a big nerd. I dressed like a boy in high school. Like I was very in my masculine. I think that's what happened, having a father that way and kind of a, uh, even my mother was kind of very much in her masculine. She was always working. She worked really late. So she never, I never saw her like, you know, doing any self care practices for herself or really nurturing herself or spoiling herself. Like that was not something that was a model for me. It was like work hard and she, and, uh, and never, and it, it was always also not being flashy and just being like, I have enough, like what the bare minimum is enough. So I never understood this idea of really putting yourself first. So I think what I ended up learning, taking away from that sort of upbringing was definitely um, this idea of always pushing to be perfect, this idea that it was never enough. And I was really, really, really in my masculine. So I had this idea of what success looked like that was very masculine. I had an idea of what relationships looked like, which was very masculine, like the way that I interacted with men um, was the way that men are with women in, in a way to protect myself based on what my father had told me that men want and how men are. I was like, well, I'll be a man so that I don't get hurt and I don't have to suffer that, which in turn led me to the, the whole, the opposite of what the intended purpose was. But initially that was kind of my, my goal. It was my defense mechanism. And I think I also shut down 
uh, a whole side of myself because I viewed the feminine as weakness and I viewed even the female body, the just emotions and all those things associated with the feminine um, as flawed, as bad, as something that gets in your way. So um, that's kind of how my upbringing affected me in my 20s. And I guess that sort of leads to uh, what, what I, we had spoken about uh, in terms of alcohol, but... Uh, so we'll, so we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. We're, we're going to get all of you. We're going to get all of you. Um, one of your favorite topics I'm sure is about your company, Alice Cass Lingerie. So lingerie, how did that come to be? <laughs> and oh my, so I told my husband that, that you're coming over to <laughs> do a podcast. He's like, are you going to peruse through the website? Are you going to choose something? Are you going to get something for later? So I'm like, Hilly, we'll talk about that later. Now <laughs> we're working. I, I need to add a few pieces to my small but cute <laughs> collection. So talk to us about Alice Cass, how that came to be, again, from a strong male energy to a soft female sexy career. Tell us. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like I never would have thought uh, that I'd end up in lingerie. I was always very interested in fashion from a young age as a means to uh, express myself, but lingerie was actually something that I was terrified of um, and nothing that I, I was never really attracted to it. I always thought it was for a different type of woman. And so I do, I do say like lingerie really chose me. Um, it kind of just happened. I don't even know how. And I think for me, it was really a healing process. Like Alice Cass is not my real name. She's kind of an alter ego that I created. And it was a safe place for me to sort of express that side of myself. But I had no idea this was happening when I started the company. It was really like, okay, I have this idea. I'm looking for fashion lingerie. Uh, I can't really find anything that doesn't feel like it's for men, that feels like it's for me. And I was always like a girl that was very single. Like I never really had boyfriends. Like I was I was like the weird, awkward girl, you know? So to me, lingerie was... Look at you now. She is not the weird, <laughs> awkward looking girl now. She's blossomed into a beautiful flower. I know this is audio, but we're going to try and get some visual there for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, it... Uh, God, it's been such a... So yeah, as I'm saying, it's been such like a healing journey. So it kind of like... I was discovering all these brands that actually were speaking to women that were made by women for women that were very, you know, a lot of them were very sexy, but it felt different than the other stuff that you see in like the traditional marketing for lingerie that is clearly made for the male audience and for the male gaze, you know, all the things with like padding and push-ups, like that's not a woman's natural shape. And that's to accentuate assets that men want to see, you know? And so I discovered all these like really beautiful lacy strappy styles that were comfortable, but wearable and you could wear them every day. They look good. You know, you don't want to hide them necessarily. And even if no one sees them, you're like, Oh wow. Like I feel amazing. Like there is really something about lingerie. Like I know the first time that I put it on, I was like, Oh my God, like that's me. Like I can look like that. And it's, I still felt like myself, but I felt like this like goddess version of myself, you know, this very powerful, sexual, but sensual kind of connected woman. And I was like, okay, this is just the beginning. Like if I can feel this way, other women can feel this way. And it's a really kind of terrifying world. If, especially in this culture that like, you know, doesn't put the feminine on a pedestal. It actually like the beliefs that I had were totally based on, society's idea of what a woman is and all the things that they tell us about us that are wrong, you know, that are not good. Um, so, so tell me, so you had this vision for lingerie and then it became an online business. I, I mean, I've seen pop-up stores for you. Tell us kind of how the business model took off. So now we know how the vision became <laughs> and you and you, your beautiful collection, your stunning collection. How can the, how can people buy, like if we want the lingerie, we, we buy it online? Yeah, so it really started, um, so the way that I started in terms of the business model um, is it was, I started as an online star. I used to be a fashion buyer. I started at Essence. I was buying like luxury clothing. Um, so I had an idea of this idea of having a multi-brand store. So I do import styles from all over. There is a line that I produce in Montreal. That's my, the Alice Katz line. Um, and... I started doing it online, but also like pop-up shops. That was like huge, especially at the beginning because people want to see it, want to feel it. It's brands they don't know um, and they want to experience it. So now I do less pop-up shops, but I have people come over to my place and just 
kind of try stuff on in my like little office showroom. Uh, they could try anything they see on the website. And uh, that's really nice because lingerie obviously is a super intimate experience. You know, it's something, it's, it's very vulnerable. You're, you're, you're stripping down, you're exposed. It's like all the things that women have with like their body image. Um, that's a whole other kind of story too. I think every woman, no matter, that was something I had to go through as well. Um, that actually Alice Cass has, has helped me with too, you know, the, like every, I feel like there's so many things about being public on social media that has like helped heal a lot of the issues that I kind of had uh, from childhood and stuff. Um, but yeah, so now people can come shop in person, but online is really the main, uh, the main channel and it's really Instagram, like a hundred percent. Like I don't do any real marketing. Like I just, um, all my investment is in the actual product. So I kind of had to find ways to do the marketing myself. And I used to be super, 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 super shy and would not do Instagram stories and would not talk to the, to the camera. And I was like, there's no way I'll ever do that. Like I can't do it. I feel like you don't need to hire any models now because you really <laughs> got over that and you're, I mean, you look really in your Thank stuff you. it's very inspiring to watch and see really thank you so much but it wasn't always it wasn't always like that like I had to overcome a lot of obstacles to get to that place which is why I talk a lot about self-love and female empowerment I feel like lingerie is such a great platform to sort of explore that and express that and heal that for women and we're definitely going to talk about um women's empowerment but so you you blogged recently on women on the fence.com yep. an amazing candid article um I, I got so many emails i can't tell you saying thank you for sharing sabrina with us and really a really moving article um so you've spoken publicly and openly about your relationship with alcohol and can you talk to us about that and then any advice you have for women who may be kind of walking the slippery slope as i'm sure many of our listeners have felt or after they hear your story, they'll, they'll say, yes. I mean, those were the emails that I got. Yes, that's me. Yes, I knew it was becoming beyond my control when. Yes, I knew it was time to change when. I didn't remember what I did four nights in a row. Um, so maybe talk to us how that, you know, happened, how that, you know, you with your relationship to alcohol, where you're at today. I know where you're at today with your relationship. But maybe <laughs> tell our viewers because I want them to know that it's okay to walk into a party and have love with themselves and have fun with themselves and have fun with the music and not need any alcohol at all to have a good time. So take us back to sort of when you knew it was, it was not right. You and your relationship with alcohol. Um, well, the thing is it's, it's tricky because my whole life I hang out with people that I, I tended to attract people with substance abuse problems and people that were excessive in that world. So to me, I never felt like I had a problem because I was always like, well, I know a million people that drink way more than I do, you know? And it took me a really long time to sort of admit to myself uh, that it was, that I wasn't happy with my relationship with alcohol. And it was pretty much my whole twenties, like in my mid twenties to late twenties, I was, really I mean I guess no I started drinking pretty young so it was like it was like my whole 20s I feel like I was I was you know going out every week I was really into partying and it was kind of an escape for me it was a real uh it was it was a way for me to escape like my mind my negative thinking my my uh my the way that I was viewing myself my anxiety I had a lot of social anxiety I had a lot like I was not comfortable in social spaces and social context I always felt weird awkward different um and I didn't embrace that I actually wanted to be more like everyone else in that sense because I realized when I was drinking I was fun I was light you know I could have those conversations with people that were surfacy and I didn't feel bad about myself and I could just be like, oh, I'm having fun. Like it's, it's gone that feeling, you know? So there was something, I felt like I was connecting to myself. So I was kind of deluding myself in that sense to, be, to being like, oh, I'm my true self when I drink. So it slowly became clear to me that it was problematic when I was actually having like blackouts. That was like the big thing where I was like, I don't remember anything from my nights. I don't remember how I ended up here. You know, I'd wake up in places, I'd wake up with people like not knowing what happened the night before, you know, so that was really, and it's funny because when you're in those situations, you're not even like, it's like, I was so, I, I would wake up and just be like, am I, 
I, I would pretend that this is what I wanted in a sense. And I wouldn't be like, I would just be like, yeah, this is fine. Like I, I know where I am. I know what I'm doing. And I never admitted like, Hey, this is like, this is messed up. Like what, yeah. what's going on? Or this is bigger than me or this is kind yeah. of beyond me and out of my power yeah. right now. Yeah. I would just like own it. I'd just be like, no, this is where I wanted to be. That was a really fun night. Like this is what, this is, oh, that was such an adventure, you know? And I am very adventurous and I love novelty. So for me it was like, oh, where am I going to end up tonight? Like what's going to happen? Um, so there was like that extreme. But then on the other hand, even when I would cut down and just go to parties, go to events. When I, when I started my business and I would go to networking events, it's like the first thing I would do is like, okay, I need to find the why so that I'm not, I don't feel uncomfortable. And even... I, I feel that that's really relatable. I know that a lot of people, they feel, oh, I need a drink to yeah. loosen up, to just be able to talk to people in yeah. this social setting. So I think that's really relatable. Yeah. And we're like really, I think as women, we're really, really encouraged to drink and to be that like flirty, fun girl, you know, and to be able to socialize and to be able to network and connect and do all those things. But it took me a long time to realize like, Hey, maybe these are just not my people, you know? And like, that was like the big turning point, um, was when I realized like I was drinking too much, I wasn't feeling good. I actually started developing like an allergy. So my body was rejecting alcohol. Like I'd get an instant headache. I'd get an instant hangover after like one drink. So I was like, okay, like something needs to change here. There's so many signs that are showing me like, okay, my memory sucks. <laughs> like my body doesn't feel good. Um, and I was just unhappy. I realized like it hit me at one point. I was like, I'm not having any of the experiences that I want from life at this point. Like I've never really had a serious emotional, emo like intimate relationship with a guy, you know, like I've had like a lot of surface things and it never led to anything deeper because alcohol is in the way, honestly. Like I feel like it's been in the way of like everything that I've ever actually wanted or was scared to admit that I wanted. I think that's a big part of it is that, you know, being so in my masculine, I've never even admitted that I wanted a relationship or that I wanted to like be feminine, you know, that was like a big block that I had. And then um, as soon as I quit drinking, I was like, wow, everything that I had been avoiding came to the surface and I had to like face a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff that I had been pushing aside and that I hadn't been addressing. So it was really, really hard. So to anyone that's like starting, it's like, it's normal that it's not easy. It's like a lot of the things that I haven't felt in my twenties, a lot of the things that happened to me that I have just been carrying that I have never spoken about or felt like are coming up. So I'll, I'll have like times when I'm just like really sad and there's not really a reason, but it's like all this emotional burden that I'm carrying that I'm like, okay, now's the time for me to process it. Like our body stores feeling, you know, it stores our emotions. So um, if we don't let it go, it kind of manifests in like a physical way or, or emotionally. So. Um, yeah, no, I, I just, because I feel that if someone is struggling with this, they may want to hear from you. So let's say they're not going to go to AA or yeah. to a first aid meeting and they're listening to this podcast and maybe you have I've never said something that maybe they realize it's time yeah. to make a change. So for you, only speaking of you personally, where mm -hmm. can they start? What's the first thing that they can do if they decide, okay, the past is the past. I realize yeah. I don't have a healthy relationship with alcohol. What can they begin to do? What can they expect to feel when they go out in social yeah. settings? And can you give them any kind of words of encouragement um, if they're starting right now, today, after listening to this podcast? For sure. Um, I didn't go to any AA meetings either. I didn't do any of that because I also, again, felt like I'm not an enough of an alcoholic. It didn't, you know, so I felt like, I don't know, I didn't feel like I had the right, in a sense, to go there. Um, so I don't think you need to hit, like, the darkest rock bottom to realize that you have a problem, to realize that, not even like, oh, I have a serious drinking problem, but I want to make a change in my life. Like, I want to I want to feel better. I want to experience life in a conscious way and for me that was like the biggest motivation was like I want to be aware I want to experience life and be here and, and, and feel it so um, I think that for sure you have to expect and understand that it's not going to be easy at first and you're going to have a lot of triggers and the thing that I did was I didn't right away change my environment and I think that's the biggest thing is like you have to understand you can't hang out with like your friends that are party animals you know or go to the same bars or go to the um, or, 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 or go to the or, or just keep redoing the things that you used to do. So it's kind of a whole lifestyle shift. So I ended up really finding ways to, uh, to replace 
those those activities because I realized, okay, I'm drinking. Every social situation revolves around alcohol. That's also what you realize. So you kind of are like, what the hell am I supposed to do with my time? You know? Mm -hmm. But I, I ended up doing so many different things. Like I, I discovered all these like spiritual workshops, um, like breath work, sound healing, like all these amazing things that just use your body and breath to kind of reach other higher states of consciousness, which is actually super inspiring and incredible to realize what your body's capable of doing without alcohol or drugs. Um, so that was like one thing, but also just doing physical activity and just like having time to do the things that I want to do, like learning and like you could you learn a new language. You, know, you have all this time, you don't have hangovers. Like it's actually incredible. And then just like meeting people and connecting with them in a real way is so rewarding. Like as I mentioned in my article, how like awkward was like the feeling I dreaded the most in my twenties. And now it's something that I actually kind of embrace. And I'm like, it's so real. Like it's so human to have those uncomfortable little moments. Um, and to kind of just shift my perspective on those situations and let things unfold and have trust in that timing. You know, that's something I always really struggled with is I had to get everything done by a certain time. And I had, you know, we all have this checklist and it's like, no, you just, take the time it takes like quitting alcohol is going to be a journey in itself, you know, and it's an amazing journey and you get to rediscover yourself and reconnect to yourself. So there's going to be ups and downs and it's about really trusting the flow. You know, we're so in the masculine idea of like this linear way of living that we forget that nature and existence is actually very cyclical, which is like a feminine concept. And everything is always going to be up and down, up and down. So it's like when you're in those lows and you feel alone and you see people on Instagram, you know, partying and you're like, oh, they look so glamorous with their alcohol. Like there is a dark side to that, you know? And, and it's I, like, I've experienced it and a lot of us have experienced it and it's really not worth it. To me, it's like, I don't know. I just did a year of not drinking and it's been like a lot of ups and downs, but I can like a hundred percent say it's the absolute best decision I've ever made for myself, like in my entire life. Like it's so empowering. It's so, it has opened so many doors for me, even in terms of like the way that I interact with myself, the way I interact with other people, um, even my business, like everything has shifted. So it's really putting yourself first, you know, and like alcohol, I used it as a way to numb myself as a way to not deal with things. And once you get rid of that, like it's hard, like anything that's worthwhile, you know? <laughs> but absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You talk a lot about self love, and that wearing lingerie is actually an act of self love. Um, I know from my life coaching practice, that insecurity and low self esteem, and even self loathing, is something that many women struggle with. How does someone begin to love themselves if they're feeling unworthy? You know, how did you find your power? You have found your power and you're not afraid to use it and show it. So how does someone begin to love themselves if they are feeling unworthy while they're listening to this? That's a big one. And that's something I think a lot of us really struggle with. I know that I didn't realize how much I was in this self-loathing state in my 20s. Um, because I wasn't facing things. And then it hit me one day, I was listening to, to a podcast that I love from this spiritual psychologist, uh, Christine Hassler, and she talks a lot about um, your inner critic and your inner child and all this kind of like, psychology, like spiritual psychology and how to heal that stuff. So that was kind of the first time I realized like, wow, I, I'm so negative and so mean to myself. Mm -hmm. So I think the first step in self-love is like acknowledging, hearing and witnessing that voice. Um, and then showing up every time it comes with like compassion and just like gentleness. It's something that I never had towards myself. I was always so critical and so like, oh, toughen up or uh, like, or just like a victim mindset or just harsh. So it was always like, how is this happening to me? Or like, it's my fault or all these things. And I, I'm all for taking responsibility in life, but also like there's certain things like everyone has childhood stuff and if you just yell at yourself and are mean to yourself like it's not going to get better that doesn't it's like parenting it's like you have to actually parent yourself the way you wish you were parented mm -hmm. so like for me it was about being like it's like soothing myself and being like it's okay like it's normal that you feel this way um you've got this, like just little things, like being your own coach, you know, like being basically what you do for other people. How, how did you get there? It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I do this line of work because my mom nurtured me and so nurturing came natural. 
how do you how do you learn how to self soothe? Do you you know do you read self help books? Do you watch YouTube videos? How do you learn to love yourself if you don't have a life coach or a therapist or a nurturing you know parent? How did you learn how to do this for yourself? Um, I've always I've always read a lot, so I've always been into um, like like researching topics. Um, I've been really into uh, like this goddess consciousness as well. So I read a lot of books around like the idea of uh, of just like different types of goddess archetypes and how every woman kind of activates different goddesses at different times in her life. So that's been really helpful and really interesting and something I really identify with. Um, and and the, there's different rituals you can do in ceremonies. And I've always also, as a kid, I was really into witchcraft and like Wicca and I would, you know, like nature. And that's also connected to nature and it's, it's ritual. And I used to do like little spells and stuff. And it's something that kind of stuck with me my whole life. So it really speaks to me to kind of do these rituals. In this winter, I did an amazing, uh, I would host these amazing like goddess circles, I would say, with some of my like closest friends. And we would, on a weekly basis, we would pull goddess cards, talk about our week, kind of, Set our, say what we would want to release and set our intentions for the upcoming week or month, depending on how often we saw each other. And that was super, super healing. So I think it's about um, just finding something that speaks to you. Like for me also podcasts, like that, that was like incredible uh, to shift sort of my mindset. So it's really about creating an environment where you, your subconscious can actually believe this new story you're telling it. Because we have all these like limiting beliefs that are come from like our childhood and, and the things that society and like our peers told us about ourselves. And we believe them and it takes a lot of work <laughs> to reprogram that stuff. So um, yeah, I think that's self-love starts with like the environment and the way you speak to yourself. Like that's always where I tell people to start. It's like really look at how you're talking to yourself. So you said two important things, self-talk and social connection, which I can tell you with my life coaching hat on is an antidote to depression and isolation, which is social connection, social connectivity, social connectedness is so important um, for our womanhood and for evolving as women. So I love that you said you get together, you release, you talk about what you're releasing, and then you set your intention for the week. So beautiful. No wonder you've done such good spiritual healing. (laughs) Um, So Sabrina, you share some pretty vulnerable pictures and videos to showcase your gorgeous line of lingerie. Um, I happen to love how you are the model of your products. How have you dealt with social media through all this? So for me, if I'm given a life coaching tip, it's not so sexy, but you are sharing vulnerable, you know, vulnerable parts of your body, of yourself. Um, there are those, you know, Lady Gaga calls it the cesspool, which is like the dark side of social media. How have you dealt with social media while exposing yourself? I mean, you come across as really confident and in your own power. I know it's taken you a lot of work to get there. Um, how have you dealt with all of this of social media, you know, through your line of work? Um, I, I actually found social media to be one of the, my favorite tools to, to, for expressing myself. And it's actually been uh, more positive than I think negative. Um, so I think it's really with the intention that I go in with it. And it's, it's been like, oh man, I, I love it. Like it was so hard for me the first time to actually start talking to the camera. And it happened after hitting like a personal rock bottom with this like guy that I had like a kind of bad experience with. And I felt, um, I did this crazy thing to go meet I met this guy on a dating app and I went to meet him in California and I didn't know him. So it was kind of <laughs> a really insane thing to do. And I'm like so crazy when it comes to things like I'll be, I'll, I'll be like an extremist. I will like, won't leave my house for like six months and then I'll do something like that, you know? So I'm trying to focus on baby stuff now. <laughs> but I'm maybe living like more in balance, Sabrina, than complete extremes. <laughs> I know. I know. That's one thing that I'm working on. But what I've learned from this is that, I mean, I always learn. And that's the thing. It's like shifting your perspective and saying, okay, like, uh, not why did this happen to me, but what is it trying to teach me? You know, that's something I always come back to. So from that experience, I felt like I hit a rock bottom in the sense that, like, I wasn't really fully myself in the experience. I wasn't able to set boundaries in the way that I would have wanted to, and I didn't show up as a version of myself that I wanted to. But looking back, obviously, it's easy to say all that. But I had to, like, through the experience, I learned so much. And I don't know what happened when I got back from that. I was able to suddenly talk because I felt like I had just, like, hit rock bottom or something and I had just been so like not who I wanted to be that I just didn't care anymore and I was just like okay I'm putting myself out there and as soon as I started talking and telling stories I started sharing my blog articles that I wrote and actually like speaking them because not everyone likes to read you know people like to see so 
and and to me these stories were so vulnerable they were really like a part of like my soul that I was like bearing and I was like okay that has so much to do with what I'm doing in terms of my business with my body with the female body you know we're we're so told that like our sexuality and our sensuality is for a man or for someone else and to me it's never been that way like I had such a weird relationship to men and to sexuality that my first step was like reclaiming my body for myself and reclaiming my femininity and lingerie has been like an unbelievable tool to sort of express that and say hey like I'm also like very multifaceted and I don't think it's fair to judge a woman who wants to express that size of herself and and act like she's less worthy of respect or less worthy or less intelligent or less serious because she has this side of herself that, you know, every woman needs to, like, I believe that we should all be able to express that. Not everyone needs to do it on the internet. That was something that for me really worked. But even if you do it at home, if it's something that, you know, like one of my practices is like lingerie selfies. And I encourage every woman to do it. You don't have to post it anywhere. You don't have to show it to anyone, but there's something about taking that time for yourself, putting on something that lights you up, that makes you feel feminine, beautiful, uh, powerful, and then just being the artist and the muse, taking those photos and witnessing yourself and creating a visual that is like, pleasing to you there's something super powerful and healing about that well we know that boudoir you know photo sessions have become really popular and that that's totally speaks to what you're saying which is to embrace so we're going to go there now so I want to talk about how women can begin to embrace their sexuality and sensuality what you would tell to any woman who is afraid or inhibited Um, what would you say to them how can we be all begin to embrace our sexuality sensuality for me uh I'm okay. I, I'm like, I, I, um, I've been with the same guy since I'm 19. So we laugh. I'm like, oh my God, we got to, you know, always find a way to spice it up. But I have learned like you with a lot of self-work and self-discovery, I have learned to embrace that, but, um, not everyone has. So where do you begin? Um, as like, this is the answer to every question to me. It's like self-love. So, um, I think that By the, you, you need to have one piece from Alice Cat, and that's, <laughs> that's the that's a good place where to start. You know, like lingerie is like a, a, a tool. You know, to me, it is a tool to like access that side of yourself. It ignites that connection to your body because it is something physical. It's, I really believe in connecting to your senses. That's something that's been really healing to me. Like being present in my body. So like dancing, uh, lingerie, like all these uh, ways to express yourself and to connect to the present moment are are really important I think we get stuck in our heads a lot so it's really about like coming down to earth and like grounding yourself in the physical so I think the first step to connecting is uh to that side of yourself really is first of all baby steps I think it's like stepping outside your comfort zone for sure but not like me like not jumping off a cliff like actually (laughs) taking baby steps and that's what Alice has has been for me like I didn't know that this was what was happening to me but I gradually became more and more comfortable like I didn't start off as like modeling my lingerie I hid my face I was not the face of my company and slowly over time I became Alice Cass so having an alter ego could be something that's uh, a way to sort of express that to feel more comfortable you know you imagine the way the type of woman that you see yourself as in that realm and that can be inspiring and doing visualization exercises and then slowly testing that out alone, you know, in your bedroom, doing the lingerie selfies, you know, um, or, or naked, whatever you feel comfortable with, you know, exploring that side of yourself on your own to me is the, is the basis. Cause it, to do that stuff with someone else is there's so many layers to that. You know, there's so much, if you're not comfortable on your own, it's going to be harder, you know? So for me, it was really taking the time to like explore my body, explore myself, alone and I'm still working on this side of it you know like it's still something uh like quitting drinking like I took a long time not dating and not having sex you know and like really being with myself and and getting to know myself and that was another big part of it was you know having that disconnected sex it's not conscious so it's really about coming back to yourself really honoring yourself really having that compassion for your body, for everything, and like celebrating yourself. To me, that's the big one. You know, women are, you know, works of art. We're beautiful. Like we're men. That's what's nice about lingerie. It's like, yes, like it's, it's a celebration of the female form. So to me, it's, it's really um, taking that time for yourself alone, you know, playing your music, like just connecting to your senses and your body. I feel like, and maybe you have this on your website, I don't know, but I feel like you need to have a page, which is like, right, how to find your, like how to begin. Mm-hmm. 
like discovering your inner goddess, yeah. right? And I feel like you need Sabrina to guide us like step one, <laughs> do this. I don't know, make a sexy playlist, be by yourself. Like, I feel like you need to give us the, the manual the or like, yes, like it's, it's your book or something, how to, how to find your inner goddess. And then, so you start here and you can't even maybe look at yourself naked in the mirror. Yeah. And by the end, you're swinging around a pole and house cast <laughs> lingerie and you're stripping for your partner and like I feel like you go from here to there but the journey of being able to start from here and not look at yourself and be able to whirl around a pool I think is not just about being you know naked it's about really like your inner confidence and your finding what lights you up and really having it radiate inside to out yeah you know but and that's it it starts it starts on the inside and it starts with loving yourself and it's really that's why you know female empowerment and self-love are so tied together yeah yeah I want you I mean you're young I'm sitting across from you you're young and beautiful but I want to ask this question because I think you've learned a lot um you know you ask what would you tell your younger self to someone who's maybe in their 40s 50s 60s but I feel that you have the ability to tell uh even our maybe our moms who are listening their daughters what would you tell your younger self even though you're young I still feel like you've lived lifetimes of wisdom so what would you tell your younger self right now I have like a whole list of things. I've actually like written this out. Um, I think one of them is just like, honestly, I would just say like, you're okay. Like you're okay. Like everything's fine. Like just trust yourself more. You don't have to be like everyone else. Like it's actually your gift, (laughs) you know, like your awkwardness and like all that stuff. It's just that I'm hypersensitive to things, you know? And so I feel the energy and I feel all these things in life. And to me, they were a hindrance and I was trying to block it. And at the end of the day, it's like, no, these are your gifts and you're good. Everything's happening in the right timing. Like you don't have to force anything. You don't have to compare yourself. Um, Just be nicer to yourself. That's like the big one. It's just be nice, be kind, be gentle. Um, Yeah. I think just like knowing, just having that soothing voice would have been like a big game changer for me. Wow. Yeah. Self-compassion. Sabrina, what's on your bucket list? I feel like you've done, listen, we know that you stay in for six months and you fly to meet some guy. That's a pretty bucket list item. I don't know, getting on a plane to meet some guy online. But anything on your bucket list? I ask a lot of people what's on your bucket list. On my bucket list? Um, I would really, there's so much like business-wise or personal. Um, I think business would be to like do more of these workshops and retreats like in person. Like that's something I'd love to do. And the guide that you just said, I'm going to have that and I'm going to send it to you. I'm going to create it to you. You better. <laughs> I, I want to read it. It's going to be in depth. We want details, how we go yeah. from here to there. We want the manual. Yeah. So like anything to do with like writing, even like, you, you know, you told me I need to write a book. Like that's something that I definitely would want to do one day. Um, yeah, I think just connecting more and like, like experiencing the community and like creating the community in, in person, you know, and more in real, like taking stuff off offline, mm-hmm. bringing it into real life. I love connecting like the luminaries thing is amazing to connect with other women. So that's something that's really been on my list of things I want to accomplish for like my business and just you know, service. Um, and then personally, I, I really want to do a spiritual retreat in Bali and or something like that, like somewhere warm and just like, you know, like hang out with like shamans and like do like deep, dark work. <laughs> like that's something I, I don't know, I'm like excited about doing eventually as well. So yeah. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Is there anything that we missed that maybe you want to teach or share any introspections that maybe we didn't cover? Um, I feel like we covered a lot. Uh, yeah, I feel like we covered a lot. I'm not sure that there's anything. I mean, there's a lot of stories. I feel like stories are really like the way I like to kind of share what I've learned. And I feel like my my mission is to kind of do crazy things and then learn from them and then share them with people so they don't have to go through the struggle that I did. Yeah, but but sometimes there's no better way to learn than to go through those shitty stories yourself. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Sometimes you have to learn that way. Yeah. So I think, yeah, if there's anything I want to leave people on is just to be nice to themselves and and uh, and start with compassion and then feel okay just being yourself. You know, the whole point of this is to just express yourself wholly and 
be like that multifaceted person that you are. You know, I think women, we're, we always try to fit into these molds and into these like roles of what we are. And we forget that we can actually be everything and be respected for being everything and to not neglect that feminine sexual side of ourselves. It, if you don't explore that, like you're blocked and you're never going to be able to get the things you want in life. Like you're magnetic when you are full, when you're full, when you're fully expressed. So to me, that's like the ultimate goal. <laughs> That's just a beautiful right way to wrap it up is to end with your whole self and the whole, you know, every facet and dimension of yourself and to learn how to embrace that. So Sabrina, thank you so much. You've been amazing. We've learned so much. You are going to write a book. You are going to write a manual. You are going to go hang out with the shamans in Bali and just make sure you take me along for the ride. Okay. Cause I want to be there right next to you. Thank you so much for being on our fourth episode, Sabrina. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. I didn't know where I was going to go, but <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Erica Diamond Podcast. For more inspirational content, head over to womenonthevents.com. Loved this episode of the Erica Diamond Podcast? Subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating or review. It's very much appreciated. Until next time.